Welcome to the Happiness Alliance training module on random and convenient samples. Let's dive in. What is the difference between a random sample and a convenient sample? A convenient sample is when you gather data for people who want to take your survey. A few factors about convenient samples important to remember. One is that the people who take your survey have chosen to take your survey. That means they have made a choice to come to your website or to come to your site and take your survey. Another factor that's important is that in order for them to make that choice, they need to be aware that there is a survey they can take. We talk in another module about awareness raising, and this is a really crucial part of convenient sampling. It cannot be underestimated the importance of awareness raising when you're doing convenient sampling. The third piece about convenient samplings that you'll want to keep in mind is that generally it is considered that when you have a convenient sample, there's some bias. Now bias means that there's some sort of influence that makes it so that the sample is not representative or is including more people of a certain nature than other people. And it's true that de facto, the bias for a convenient sampling is the kind of people who would come and take a survey. Now, this is true also for a random sampling because people aren't forced to take a random sample. There is some bias of the people who would answer the questions or the kind of people who would take a survey. Okay, another piece about convenient sampling. Oftentimes it's said that convenient samplings are not representative. We'll talk a little bit about representation, but two things about convenient samplings that are, that are important to remember. One, convenient samplings do represent the feelings, the impressions for the people who took the survey. Secondly, you don't know if a convenient sampling is actually representative or not representative of a population. You can't say definitively that it is or isn't unless you do some ground truthing. There's two ways to do ground truthing. One, do a random sampling. Secondly, you now with the happiness index, you can do some ground truthing because many of the questions in our happiness index are drawn from other surveys where there has been data gathered. And so you can look at that and ground truth is the data that you got similar to the data that was gathered by another method that was random. Another thing that's important to think about with convenient sampling is that the data does give you directions. So for example, say you take Gets, gather some data for a certain population. Now you don't gather enough data so that you can say that, that the data is representative of about that population, but let's just say you gather data for an immigrant uh, population or for a young women, and you find that their scores are much lower than you thought they would be. Now, we don't know that that's representative, but we do know that it gives us some direction. It indicates that there is a need to better understand how people are doing for that demographic. Here are some discussion questions for this part of this little module. I'd encourage you to download these. You can download these on the on happycounts.org on our website and ask yourself these questions and have them in your classroom or in your own venue. Okay, I've talked a little bit about populations. So what is a population? We're going to use a definition that um, I like that we've come up with. It's just everybody you care about. If you're going to be gathering happiness data for a population, you're going to want to include everybody you care about. So for example, let's just say that you were the mayor or the president and you wanted to know how people were doing in your country. You'd want to know how everybody was doing, not just your citizens, but also your residents. You'd want to know how undocumented people were. And you might want to also know how people living abroad are doing. Now, if you were the kind of ruler who just didn't care how certain populations were doing, that's because you didn't care about them. And we wouldn't want to be that kind of ruler. For a business, you might want to gather data for your customers as well as potential customers and other stakeholders. What are stakeholders? Those are people who are materially impacted or could be materially impacted both positively or negatively by whatever it is you're doing. Now this this way of defining stakeholders is true for businesses, for government, for civil society, for education, for everybody. So really, in a sense, you wanna gather data for all of your stakeholders because you care about them. You can go ahead and think about what is the population that you would be caring about if you were 
leading up a non-governmental organization, a nonprofit or a civil society organization. You'd want to be thinking about the people you served, your donors, your staff, and every all of your other stakeholders. If you're in a classroom and you're the professor or maybe a fellow student, your stakeholders in the classroom would be everybody in the classroom. But if you let up a school, say you're a student who wants to know how your whole school or your whole campus is doing, you'd want to gather data for your students, for your staff, for your faculty, even the cleaners, everything from the people who maintain and keep the organization going to the cleaners. You'd also want to gather data from the alumni, people who had graduated, and for potential stu students, as well as employers and other stakeholders, because you want to be able to know how are they doing and how can you fit their, your happiness goals to meet their well being for all of your population. Okay. Populations in the happiness index and other surveys are described by demographics. These are descriptors for the populations. And you have many different ways that you can describe your population by demographics. The common ones are age and gender. Geographics, this is a very important one often, especially when we want to get what we call to granularity. We'll show that in a little bit. You can look at marital status, education level, income, a political persuasion, all kinds of different factors. You can imagine all of the different factors that you could use to describe a population. Now, of course, if you have too many different factors, your survey is going to get too long and people aren't going to want to take that survey. So now that you understand what a population is, we're going to talk a little bit about random sampling. So random sampling means that you get a sample. A sample is just those are the people that you survey. That's what a sample is. We'll talk about that in another video, but we'll say this, that a sample are the people that you survey within your population. A random means that, this, that those people that you survey and the data that you get actually represent your population. What's so great about random samples? They're trustworthy. This means that policymakers and others can make decisions based on them. And I say sometimes because there's a whole lot that's happening in the world around gathering data and methods of gathering data. And we talked a little earlier about bias. It used to be about 20 years ago or even less, representative samples, random samples were gathered with telephones. People would call up and people would answer their telephones. And that's how they gathered data. Today, if you get a call from somebody you don't know, you don't recognize that number, you're probably not going to answer that call, right? So what are some other ways that you can gather, gather data that you know that it would be representative, that you wouldn't have some bias in there, that you wouldn't have some big hurdles in there? We'll talk about that in another training. The other piece about random sampling is that we talked a little bit more about bias here, that methods can hide that bias or discrimination when applied generally. And we're going to show that how in random samples, particularly in averages, can, can hide different factors within your population. Random sampling can be very expensive. If it's done by a pollster, you might hire a pollster and that can run quite a bit of money. It can also be very expensive in terms of the amount of resources or the time that you might need to put into gathering data. Here's some discussion questions about random samples. And I'd like you to think about these, these discussion questions in terms of the next piece of this training and then come back to these discussion questions. So we have a couple of exercises. In the first exercise, you're going to take whatever your group is, say it's your classroom, or if you don't have a classroom, then maybe it's a group of students, your friends or your family, or maybe it's people at work. And gather data from the people that are the four people that are closest to you. If it's just four people, then just gather data from two people and calculate the average for this one question on a scale of zero to 10, with 10 being the very happiest and zero for not at all happy. How happy are you right now? So gather that data, calculate that average. Now, assign each person in your group a number and randomly select 10 people out of your classroom. There's different ways that you can do this, and you can always look online to see how to do this in, in Excel. Um, but go ahead and gather data from 10 different people in your classroom and calculate that average and see how the two different. Now gather data from, for everybody and calculate that average and see how those are different. What do you think about those differences and how could you use, if the differences are, are big, how could you use the data? How would you talk about or think about the data when the differences are big? And if the differences are not big, if it's just one or maybe 
um, one and a half or less than one point between the differences. How do you explain that? What do you think about that? Now, there are no right or wrong answers to this. These are just food for thought. Okay, now we're going to look at this exercise, but we're gonna take it a little further and we're gonna see how we can weight data. Okay, so this is going to be important when you are gathering a random sampling or when you're gathering enough data that you know that it's a random sampling. Now, this is something that I didn't mention earlier, but it's important to know that there is an actual calculation that you can use for how many people you can gather data from with, for example, even a convenience sampling so that you know that the data is representative. In general, for a small population, say 30 people, it's going to be a high number. That would be 28 people. So the smaller your population, the more people you need to gather data for. So this is the next exercise. We have two different questions. One is about gender and one is about satisfaction with life. The first thing that you do is you count how many females, how many males, and how many others you have in your classroom. Now, people may or may not want to identify as others who may want to just do female, male, and prefer not to answer. Now, go ahead and gather the data that describes your demographics for your population. Next, choose 10 people randomly and gather the data for both question one and question two. Now, I know they already answered question two, but what you want to do is gather the data for both of those questions. When you do that, calculate the averages for each gender then calculate the weighted average. And I'm going to show you how to do that. And then after you've done that, you want to do the same thing for 95% of your class. Don't include 5% of your students. So let's look at how, how you do the weighted averages. How do you do weighted averages? Now, you can go online and figure this out, um, or you can follow this instruction. Um, you can also find textbooks for how to do this. All right, so with weighted averages, remember we already counted the demographics for our class. So we know that in this class, this is an example, there's 30 people. We have 12 females, 12 males, and six people who say others. Now we know that that's 30 people. So now we're gonna calculate the percent. So it turns out that 12 out of 30, so 12 divided by 30 is 40%. Same thing for again, and then six out of 30 is 20%. So our weight factor now is that percent. We'll just put that in decimals. That's our weight factor. So the next step is, remember we had that sample where we were gathering data for just 10 people. So our next step is we're gonna count the demographics of the sample. So out of those 10 people, we had five females, one male, and four people who said other. It's a little bit of a strange sample, right? Because we all we have a lot more males um, proportionally than we actually gathered data for. So, but we did this randomly. Let's just assume we did this randomly. We did this randomly. So how do we ensure that all of the different aspects of demographics are re represented? So the way we do that is by weighted averages. So now that we have gathered our data for our sample, we're going to go ahead and calculate the average scores for all of the females, for all of the males, and for all of the others. And we ask them that question, how satisfied are you with your life on a scale of 1 to 10? And it came out to 7.5 for females. We'll call it 75. We talk a little bit about why we scale on a scale of 0 to 100 in, the, in another video, but you can call it 7.5 because you did it in, um, in a, on a zero to 10 scale, or you can easily transform that other by just multiplying by 10. So now, now that we have our scores, our average scores for each one of the population that we gathered for, we're going to multiply the average score for the demographics of our sample within our population by the weight factor. So 0.4 times 75 is 30. 0.4 times 70 is 28, and 0.2 times 60 is 12. And then we add those together. So we don't actually multiply these, we add them, and that comes to 70. So what that would say is that our data tells us that overall for our population, their sense of how satisfied with their life it comes out to 70 out of 100. That's a pretty good score. Now, I want to show you an example of how you would do this for a demographic for your population. So here's different neighborhoods. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different neighborhoods here. 
happy hills, peaceful islands. Now look at our populations for the different neighborhoods. We've got almost 10,000 people living in happy hills. That's the population, that's the area with the highest population. And we have almost 10,000 people living in unincorporated. So they're not actually living in a neighborhood that has representation. Uh, they don't get to vote in certain elections. They may not have amenities in them, these unincorporated areas. We don't know. It depends on what your population is. This is just an example. What is the percent of each population? Do you remember this, how we did this? We took the, the number of people living in that, in that area and we divided it by the total and that came to 21%. And we see here in unincorporated, it was 20%. And now we get our weight factor. Now we're gonna do a random sample of 47,000 people or maybe we'll do a convenient sampling of 47, 748 people. And the amount of people that we're going to actually sample is 713. Maybe we did a convenient sampling, maybe we did a random sampling, but there it is. That's the number of people that we gathered data for. Now we can count how many people from each one of the different areas provided their data. How many survey takers we have from each area. We had 40 from Happy Hills. 19 from unincorporated and peaceful islands had 414 quite a few people right so if we just calculated the average scores for every single person um, then peaceful islands their scores would count 414 times whereas unincorporated would only count 19 times so we we don't want to do that because that's going to skew our results but i'm going to show you how averages also skew our results so here we have the average score from each sample. So in Happy Hills, people score at about a 78 out of 100. So they're pretty darn happy and satisfied about their lives. But in Unincorporated, they're just below feeling indifferent. That's not very good. So we want to know what happens when we do a weighted score. Remember how we did a weighted score? We took the average score from that particular aspect of demographics and we multiplied it by the weight factor to get the weighted score and then we added them all together after we did that for every single one and we came up with a satisfaction with light score for for all of our area at 65.84 percent but it's pretty important to note that the unincorporated are only coming in at 43 now 43 is of only 19 people out of 9,504 people is not a very big sample. That's a very small sample, actually. So probably what this would tell us is that it would be a really good idea to get more people from the unincorporated to take the survey so that we can get better data. And that's one of the ways that convenient samplings can be very helpful. So please go to the Happiness Alliance website at happycounts.org you'll be able to find the tools and resources that you need, including downloadable sheets and the presentation so that you can make the world a better place and a happier place. Thank you.